जय राधा माधवा कुंज विहारे Bhagavatam, Canto 10, Chapter 60, Krishna teases Rukmini, verses 3, 4, 5, and 6. Okay. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. 
Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Tasmir Antar Griha Brajan Mukta Dhamma Vilambina Virajite Vitalena Deepayar Mani Mayar Api Tasmin Antar Grihe Brajan Mukta Dhamma Vilambina Virajite Vitalena Deepayar Mani Mayar Api Tasmin Antar Grihe Bhajan Mukta Dhamma Vilambina Virajite Vitalena Deepayar Mani Mayar Api Asmin, in that Antar Grihe, private part of the palace, private part of the palace, Brajat, brilliant, Mukta, of pearls, Dhamma, with strings, Vilambina, hanging, Mani, of jewels, mayai, maid, api, also, malika, of jasmines, damabi, with garlands, pushpai, with flowers, dwi rapya, of bees, kula, with a swarm, Nadite, resounding, jala, of the lattice windows, randra, through the small halls, pravistai, which entered, cha, 
and go be, I'm sorry, go be with the rays, <clears throat> Chandramasa of the moon, Amalai, spotless, Parijata of the Parijata trees, Vana of the grove, Amoda carrying the fragrance, Vayuna by the wind, Udyana of a garden, Salina bringing the presence, Dubai with incense, Aguru from a guru perfume, Jai produced, Rajan, O King Parikshit, Jalarandra, through the halls of the lattice windows, Vinir Gatai, existing, Paya, of milk, Faina, the foam, Nibe, resembling, Subre, shining, Paryanke, on the bed, Kasipu, Kasipu, on a pillow, Utame, excellent, Upastaste, she served, Sukha, comfortably, Asinam, seated, Jagatam, of all the worlds, Ishwaram, the Supreme Controller, Patim, her husband. So now we're entering into the scene, which will be the foundation for the rest of the chapter. Queen Rukmini's quarters was extremely beautiful, boasting a canopy hung with brilliant strings of pearls, as well as effulgent jewels serving as lamps. Garlands of jasmine and other flowers hung there, here and there, attracting swarms of humming bees. And in the spotless rays of the moon shone through the holes of the lattice windows, a guru incense drifted out of the window holes, my dear king. The breeze wafted the scent of the Parijata grove, carried the moon, I'm sorry, carried the mood of a garden into the room. There the queen served her husband, the supreme lord of all the worlds, as he reclined upon an opulent pillow on her bed, which was as soft and white as the foam of milk. Hmm. You get the description? Quite, quite opulent, very beautifully explained what is the inside of Rukmini's palace, and Krishna is there. Purport. According to Srila Sridhar Swami, Rukmini's palace was quite famous then as now, and these descriptions give a glimpse into its opulence. Srila Vishwanar Chakravarti Vakur adds that the word Amalai in this verse may also be read Arunai, which would indicate that when this pastime took place, the moon had just risen, bathing the entire palace in beautiful, ruddy moonshine. Omagyan timirandasya genajana salakaya chaksun militam yena tasmai shri gurveno maha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stapti Tamyena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kidam Mayam Dadanti Swam Padanti Kam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaudavani Pucharine Nirvise Sasunyavari Pastyatya De Sitarine Vanshakalpa, Taru Vistya, Kripa Sindhu, Bebacha, Patitanam, Bhavane, Bio, Vaishnavi, Bio, Namaho, Namaha, Sri Krishna, Chaitanya, Prabhu, Nityananda, Sri Advaita, Gadadara, Sivasari, Gauda, Bhakta, Rinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare, 
हरे राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे सो द्वारका One of the three main abodes of Lord Krishna, as he performed his pastimes on this planet, we have Dwarka, we have Mathura, and then we have Vrindavan. It says, Dwarka is best, Mathura is better, and Vrindavan is the supreme of all. They're all good because they're all connected with Krishna. But the sweetness is gradually increased accordingly. Here you can see there is a very beautiful sweetness that pervades from this description. As the Lord is with his principal queen, Rukmini, there were 16,108 queens. And Krishna, being the supreme personality of Godhead, would visit every queen every day. <laughs> How he would do that is explained in a very nice description when Sri Narada Muni came to see Krishna in Dwarka. Anarada came into one of the palace. And there was Krishna with one of his queens playing with some children. And then he left that palace, went to another palace, and there Krishna was with another queen playing a game of chess. He left that palace, he went to another palace, and there was Krishna sitting and talking with another queen. So every palace he went to, he saw the same Krishna with a different queen performing a different activity. <laughs> Yogis can expand themselves a very powerful yogi can expand himself into nine forms of himself. But those expansions are like TV. In other words, if you were to turn on nine TVs all on the same channel, you would see the whole, the same thing. But Krishna, when he expands, he can be expanding into himself and be doing different things in different places. The same Krishna. Uh, he's, he is the source of all opulence and he manifests his expansions. Why? Just to give pleasure to his devotees. Each one of the queens wanted to be with Krishna. And therefore, in order to please each one of them, he expanded himself in such a way that he appeared to be only with that queen. And that queen would think, oh, Krishna is only with me. You hear also in the prayers that are often said that uh, one becomes so absorbed in loving Krishna that they think there's nothing else but you and Krishna. Just like you see in the Christ Christian tradition that they sometimes they say that Jesus is the only son of God. That can be taken in two ways. But one, one thing is that is that there is such a love for that personality, it seems like there's no one else. Just like when you are in love with someone, you have such an intimate relationship that the rest of the world just has no meaning anymore. It just stops. <laughs> and that, that relationship becomes everything. So Krishna is showing that through this, um, this particular manifestation how each and every queen is feeling the happiness of Krishna's association. And each are enjoying Krishna's association by serving him and playing with him and doing different things in different ways. Dwarka was the king of opulences that had so many beautiful palaces. Those palaces were not like the palaces we see nowadays. There were no lights in the palaces. All of the illumination in the palaces were given by beautiful jewels that were embedded in the walls and hanging from the different uh, chandeliers in the palace. There were so many jewels, emeralds and rubies and diamonds. And of course, one jewel you never hear of anymore, lapis lazuli, which was very prominent years ago. All of these jewels were so bright that there were but there was no need of any, any artificial light coming from. Even the sun was not even needed. <laughs> it was like that. So this is Krishna's opulence. Wherever he, he is, it's just like it says in the very 
end of the Bhagavad Gita, the last verse in the Bhagavad Gita, where it says, wherever there is Krishna and his pure devotee, there is always victory, extraordinary power, power, opulence, and what's the last one? Hmm? Morality, right. Yeah, those four things are always there in the presence of Krishna. So as long as we stay close to Krishna, everything is wonderful. <laughs> what makes life tough is when we get away from Krishna <laughs> or we forget Krishna or we try to figure out how to live life separate from Krishna. Then life becomes difficult, we struggle, we have so many problems. As long as we stay close to Krishna, and how to stay close to Krishna, Krishna gives in the Bhagavad Gita, manmana bhava mad bhakto, mam yuji mam namaskuru, mam si satyam te pratijano veosi me. He says, always think of me, become my devotee, Worship me and offer your homage, which he means pay your obeisances to me. So we do those four things. We remember Krishna. We worship him in different ways. We chant his holy name and we uh, offer our respects and obeisances. And Srila Prabhupada said these four principles make up the entire process of devotional service. And when you expand them into different aspects of themselves, you get the 64 regulative principles that are mentioned in the nectar of devotion, which Krishna, and to make it easy, has condensed those 64 into 15 in the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Those of you who are interested, it's in the 11th canto, 19th chapter, verses 20 through 24, five verses, where as Krishna explains the entire ingredients which make up pure devotional service which he condensed in the Bhagavad Gita into four. <laughs> and so uh, the process of devotional service is nicely explained. And here we're getting a little bit of a glimpse of the beauty and the opulence and the sweetness that is there with Krishna and his principal queen, Rukmini. I won't go into the details of that, what, what will be happening in the rest of this chapter because it's so nice. I'm attempting to explain a little bit because it's so sweet. But Krishna, and one of the qualities of Krishna that he has towards his devotees, he's always in trying to increase our devotion to him. Not just sometimes, always. <laughs> He uses his different energies, and sometimes he does it directly, to somehow or other help us become more and more attached to him, more and more devoted to him in the activities we perform, more and more focused on him in everything we do. So Krishna will see what the devotee will need in order to do that, and he will help that devotee. If the devotee is going away from him, the devotee Krishna will try to bring that devotee back in different ways by sending a representative or sending a situation which reminds them of Krishna consciousness. If they don't wake up to that, then Krishna will send some suffering. And this suffering is actually his mercy because it helps us to remember, oh, that I'm suffering because I'm not really connected with Krishna. Because those who are connected with Krishna, they don't suffer. We might think they do, but it, do, it just looks like that. They, they don't suffer. But the suffering is one of the means by which Krishna brings his devotee closer to him. And of course, uh, he does it mostly through his mercy, which is the spiritual master, as he sends the spiritual master, which is the mercy manifestation of himself. He makes that process very direct and easy. And he presents himself in the form of his representative who teaches exactly what he teaches. The spiritual master doesn't give anything different than what Krishna wants for that devotee. And therefore the spiritual master is called the mercy manifestation of Krishna. Sometimes he's called um, God, servitor Godhead. That's another title for the spiritual master. 
There is God who is served, that's the Krishna, and God who is serving, that's the spiritual master. Although he is not God, he is seen like that, nor does he claim to be God. Of course, Prabhupada was very strong over that, the spiritual master is not God. But for his disciples, he should be seen that way and worshipped like that, because that worship goes to Krishna as being the transparent via media or the means by which we, we serve the Lord, he becomes that, that uh, channel by which we offer our bhakti to Krishna and Krishna takes it, uh, I mean, the spiritual master takes it and offers it to Krishna. And when Krishna, when the spiritual master gives what we offer to Krishna, then that, that, uh, that, that offering is perfect. We can, therefore, we, we say, don't try to approach Krishna directly. Although we have a direct approach to him, he, in other words, a direct relationship with him, that relationship is always there. Krishna is in the heart of all living entities. But Krishna manifests himself externally as the spiritual master. He's called Antaryami, or the indwelling super soul that is now the external manifestation of that same super soul and that is the spiritual master so then way we can approach krishna with no problems and make progress towards ultimately the goal of devotional service which is to bring out one's love for krishna as you'll see in this chapter this is what krishna is doing to rukmini he's giving her some some difficulty <laughs> Apparently, he's criticizing her, and he's not criticizing her. He's conjoling her in a in a very, well, unpleasant way, according to uh, her mood. And what he's trying to do, he's trying to bring out that love by doing it. But what happened? It failed. <laughs> Krishna failed <laughs> because she just turned it around. And made it, she showed her love for him in a different way. The way he tried didn't work. <laughs> but still, although it didn't work, it was the prelude or the way to bring out her love in another way, which ultimately was the success because that's what he wanted to do. He wanted her to show her, her love for him, but he wanted to do it in a way that he thought would be the best way. <laughs> to do it, but it didn't work. But it, but it worked anyway because she showed her love using a different mood of expression. This is a very wonderful chapter. It's one of the sweetest chapters in the Bhagavatam. Um, please come and hear the classes all day. And you can also read ahead to get more of this beautiful. How Krishna deals with his devotees. Krishna is by nature very kind. The non-devotees, they cannot experience the kindness of Krishna because they see Krishna as their representative to give them material things. The materialists, they don't want God, but they want what he gives. So they approach the Lord for these things. And when he doesn't give, their enthusiasm for, for whatever prayers they make becomes less. They're always interested in trying to get something from God. And that getting is usually something that really doesn't help them in their life because that's what they think they need. All living entities need one thing. They need loving relationships. That is the basis of life. Without love, there's no meaning to life. And loving relationships are found in Krishna. And when we have loving relationships with Krishna, or at least try to develop those loving relationships, we can also do that with all living entities because Krishna is the, he's called Mula. Mula means root. So he is the root of all existence. So when one develops their attraction for Krishna and their some preliminary love for Krishna, it expands itself out to all living entities. Therefore, one becomes the well-wisher and the friend of all living entities on behalf of Krishna. This is how it works. People are trying to do that without including Krishna. They want to be the best friend, well-wisher, supplier, uh, you know, nice guy, 
uh, people in the world, but they do it in a way without the Lord. And therefore, their motivation really is not about so much about helping that person, although it might be there, but as, as, being, as getting something from that activity. But when we do it on behalf of Krishna, or connected with Krishna, there's no personal motivation. The motivation is to give Krishna to others. And giving Krishna to others means that we have to have Krishna ourselves. So as much as we have Krishna, we can give Krishna to others. So therefore, as we strengthen our own spiritual life, we have something to offer to others. And so therefore, everything is centers around our own spiritual development, and then we can give to others. Of course, everyone has something on whatever level they're practicing, so that much they can offer. But when, when we actually know what Krishna is like, how he acts, how he thinks, how he interacts with his devotees, how he connects with the material energy, what is his relationship to so many things? Then we get an understanding of how our relationship with Krishna actually develops when we understand what is his qualities, what is his nature. One of the first principles that we can understand, although it's a generic statement, is that he is very kind. He is really very, very kind. And to show his kindness, he actually manifests himself in another form to show even greater kindness, and that is Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Sri Krishna made it a little difficult when he was here in order to worship him and serve him and to surrender to him. Lord Chaitanya has made it easy. But he's giving the same kindness, and even more so, in a very easy and very natural way, to chant the holy names of the Lord with enthusiasm and with devotion, to uh, hear the glories of the Lord in the scriptures such as Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita, to associate with devotees who are doing the same thing and share Krishna consciousness to in each other and develop relationships based on that. Because Krishna consciousness is about creating a spiritual family. So maybe some of us don't want to be included in the spiritual family, but still, that is the mood of Vaishnav culture, to bring everyone together with Krishna as the center and each other as a relationship with each other, keeping Krishna in the center and having relationships with each other based on our relationship with Krishna. And that relationship with Krishna is foundational to all relationships because when you have a relationship with Krishna, everything else becomes natural at least understandable and understandable in such a way that one knows what we should one what should, what what should do and what we should avoid so as that develops more and more the more we know about krishna the more we can actually develop our attraction for krishna because krishna is all attractive his first principle he's very kind and he manifests his kindness by sending the spiritual master, by giving himself in the form of his deity. Just like just recently, we opened up a temple a few days ago, not long, last weekend, in the, in the, the uh, suburbs of Chicago, Naperville. And the Lord was sitting in a box for how many years? <laughs> how many? 15 years, those, the deities that were installed were waiting to show their mercy to us. They could have left. You can't think, well, just because they're a deity, they can't. I've seen that, too. I've seen when they keep deities waiting too long, sometimes the Lord disappears. Somebody comes and takes them, but Krishna arranges that, please steal me. They don't really want me here. <laughs> yeah. So... The deity is so merciful, he waited 15 years and now he's installed. And now he's there to give his mercy in the form of a, the worship. And what is that mercy? It's almost like a child to a parent. The parent becomes the, the devotee becomes the parent, the Krishna becomes the child. What do you do when you're a parent? 
you take care of your child. Sometimes you wake them up, sometimes you feed them, sometimes you make sure they get clean, bathe them, you supply clothes to them to wear, you also give them presents, you also guide them also. So the deity actually manifests himself as the child of the devotee in order to accept the love for the, from the devotee. And that is very intimate when you think about it. <laughs> it's very intimate. It's so intimate. We do that in this material world with our, with our family members. But when we do it with Krishna, it's so sweet and so reciprocal because Krishna is not only accepting our service, but he's reciprocating that service also. He's giving back his mercy in the form of detachment from this material world, intelligence by which we can understand how to worship him and transcendental happiness. All of this comes through the service of the Lord. So he's very kind, extremely kind. And anyone who gives his mercy to others becomes favored by the Lord. Although the Lord says, I'm equal to everyone. Samoham, Samabhute, Shunam, Edwesha, Srinapriya. He says, I'm equal to everyone. I envy no one, nor am I partial to anyone. But those who worship me are a friend in me, and I am a friend in them. In other words, as you approach me, I reward them you accordingly. So, if we, Krishna comes to this world in different manifestations, why? To uplift the world, to remove irreligion, and to reestablish or re energize religious principles and to give pleasure to his devotees. So, if you're taking up the process of helping him do that by becoming his instrument, by giving it to others. And Krishna really gives that devotee a lot of mercy. By how you approach me, I warn you accordingly. So that's the secret of success in Krishna consciousness. Become Krishna conscious and try whatever way you can, whatever facilities you are, whatever intelligence, abilities, words, Whatever opulence is, whatever you have, try to use it to bring others to Krishna consciousness. And you will see, not in the material way, because in the material way, when you use something, it becomes less. But in the spiritual way, when you use something in the service of Krishna, it becomes more. The more you use your intelligence, the more intelligence you get. The more you use your words, the more Krishna gives you those words to use again and better. The more you use your money or finances or opulences, you'll get more. Krishna says, oh, they're using all these things, let, them, let me give them more so they can continue. If you use your time for Krishna, he gives you more time. <laughs> you might not be able to figure that one out, but it works. <laughs> it works. Uh, because Krishna is the feature of all existence. And when you concentrate on Krishna by using what he gives you, he expands that that element unlimitedly. And you'll see, just so you can see the life of Srila Prabhupada. How old was Prabhupada? He was in his 70s, approaching 80. But he was sleeping two hours a night, that's all. Maybe an hour and a half a night, that's all. In the daytime, he would sleep maybe an hour after breakfast, an hour after lunch and two hours, an hour and a half at night. And the rest of the time, he would travel around the world, open up temples, translate books, uh, meet important people. If you study the life of Prabhupada, how much he did, impossible. No ten, 10 men cannot do what Prabhupada did. Why? Because he was completely absorbed in serving Krishna with everything he had. And therefore, Krishna was giving him everything more. And he would always say, it's by Krishna's mercy I'm doing everything. It's by Krishna's mercy that this movement is expanding. I'm simply trying to do it. Even when he was writing his books, uh, he would read his books. Prabhupada would read his own books. And sometimes the devotees would see Prabhupada reading his books by himself. 
And they would ask, Prabhupada, you wrote these books, you're reading them. Prabhupada said, I didn't write them. These are Krishna's words. I'm just putting them on paper. That's all. I'm just simply putting whatever Krishna tells me. So Prabhupada knew he was the he was the messenger or the via media to give Krishna to the world. And that is not limited to one person. So as much as we take up this process of Krishna consciousness in a serious way, the much we can be an instrument to spread Krishna consciousness. And then Taktwa uh, Dehom Purna Jan Mani Naiti Mani If you preach Krishna consciousness and you make that in your life, you'll go back home back to God. There's no doubt about that. And because everything will be provided by Krishna. And see, we in and of ourselves, we are simply deficient. Whatever we have, we somehow learned or we got some some pious credits from some from previous pious activities. But these things are also given by Krishna. And Krishna gives everything and he also is the element by which he removes things also. So the more we engage in devotional service, reading the books, chanting, ch uh, engaging in various types of activities, the more the devotee becomes happy and the more one becomes connected with Krishna in devotional service. And then we can learn, we learn how kind Krishna is. He's supremely kind. Uh, his kindness cannot be measured in terms of anything from the worldly calculations. His kindness is unlimited. He allows, in the form of Lord Chaitanya, he is called Karuna Avatar. Namo Mahavadanaya Krishna Prema Padayate Krishnaya Krishna Chaitanya Namani Gauda Triste Namaha Namo Mahavandanaya He is so merciful. Even if a person is unqualified, still he tries to make that person qualified by giving his mercy in different ways. Prabhupada compares Lord Chaitanya to a person who just randomly selects a person who is unqualified and gives them a, a lot of gifts. It's not that they even deserve the gifts. <laughs> I remember when I was a kid, and this is a good analogy, there used to be a uh, TV show, it was called The Millionaire. <laughs> I don't know, it goes way back to the 60s, I think, maybe even before that, 1960s where this uh, person, who later became president of the United States, Ronald Reagan, mm -hmm. he was the star of the show, the TV show. And um, he was a uh, servant of a very rich man who you never saw. <clears throat> and this rich man, in every show, this rich man would think of a particular person that he knew, and he wanted to give that person one million dollars. <laughs> So the person didn't even know the rich man. But the rich man would call his servant, who was at that time Ronald Reagan, and he would say, here's a check, and you go to this person and you give this check for $1 million. So that was the show. So all of a sudden, one person, he would knock on the door and say, I have a gift from you from this very wealthy man he wants to show. And so what was the qualification for that person? He just became a favorite of that rich man, that's all. That's all. So if Krishna favors you, then <laughs> there's nothing else to be <laughs> to to to, uh, to aspire for because there's no, no one else can compare to what Krishna is offering to us, eternal life in the spiritual world. And, and also happiness in this world as we engage in his service. That's Krishna consciousness. And so that's Krishna's mercy. And Lord Chaitanya is exhibiting that because he is Krishna himself. He's giving that mercy so easily in the form of this Sankirtan movement. By chanting, dancing, taking prasadam, reading books, associating with devotees, making time to worship the deity, making the deity so attractive that 
when people come, they say, oh, wow, how beautiful that looks. <clears throat> Just like sometimes people, they come in and they see Srila Prabhupada and they, and they come next to Prabhupada and they say, oh, we, they become very quiet because they think, well, maybe he's in meditation. We don't want to disturb him or something. <laughs> And they see the deity of Prabhupada and they think he's sitting there. He is, really. But it's a Morti, but still it's Prabhupada. But it becomes so manifest that it's even an ordinary person sometimes sees, oh, like why we used to do tours in Srila Prabhupada's palace in New Vrindavan. And there'd be one room where Prabhupada would have his library. And we made a deity of Prabhupada there sitting and writing books. So when we, I would give tours and we would bring in these groups of people and they would look at it. Oh, he's writing. <laughs> they didn't see it was a deity. They think, yeah. So that, the, the, that mercy is, is manifested in so many different ways that the Lord and the deity is there. We should always remember that, that although it's a deity, it's Krishna. Although it's the deity, it's Prabhupada. It's non-different. I'll give you a story to help illustrate that. Um, the devotees were bringing in the mercy of Srila Prabhupada in one country in, in Africa. So when they came to the immigrations, they checked what they had, and they, it was a mercy of Prabhupada. They were going to install it in their temple. But unfortunately, they didn't have the what they call proper papers to bring in the murti. So the immigration officer said, well, you can't bring him on in unless you clear your papers up. So the, then the immigration officer said, we have a warehouse here and we can put him in the warehouse and then when you get the papers and you can have your, your, uh, your teacher. <laughs> they were a little bit sensitive. So they took Prabhupada and put him in a warehouse, the deity. After two days, the devotees got a call. They had left their phone number. And the, the immigration officer said, I, I think he wants to go. He keeps saying, get me out of this place. <laughs> get me out of this place. So Prabhupada was actually speaking, and the immigration officers were hearing. Prabhupada was saying, I don't want to be here. <laughs> So they told the devotees, you can read it in a book by Ritter. Ritter writes this in his book on preaching in South Africa. and see, preaching in Africa. He describes this story. And, um, and then, of course, the devotees came and took the deity. So the deity is there. If we think it's just a statue, then Arche Vishnu Sila Di Guru Namati. Then we're not seeing properly. We're seeing materially. But the deity is there, Krishna is there, the spiritual master is there. And it's not just for worship, it's to, to offer our loving relationship to the deity in the form of our devotion, our worship. So Krishna is, of course, to illustrate that point, he is so kind and he's always trying to bring his devotee closer to him. So if we can take his mercy in whatever way it comes, gradually we'll make progress and ultimately become qualified to leave this material world and go back to the spiritual world. And that is the goal of Krishna consciousness. Okay, questions, comments? Yes. Thank you so much, Maharaj. We feel sad that you're leaving uh, to, tonight. Uh, it's so wonderful to have you here. We're always looking forward to you coming back more and more. So thank you. Um, you brought out this something that is very touching, uh, that this desire that Krishna has to bring people closer, to bring us closer to him. In, in devotion, in love. And when we become instruments to that, is we receive so much blessings and mercy. Mm. And in one sense, that's the purpose. We are 
are becoming servants of the deities, and that's their mission, that's their purpose that they have. And mm. in one sense, this is the purpose of this. It's the purpose temples. of everything we do. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you, um, you also brought out that, you know, to understand how to use one's abilities and dovetail them for fulfilling that purpose to bring people, to bring others closer to Krishna. Um, when we are, in one sense, by ourselves, it becomes easier. But when we become part of the deity staff, part of their personnel, uh, then it's not as simple. So I wanted to ask you, how can we understand this principle of dovetailing our abilities when we are in a community of devotees who are trying to fulfill uh, the missions of the deities? <laughs> Just do it. <laughs> Whatever propensities, intelligence, abilities, time, just use it. That's all. You should, we shouldn't wait for somebody else to inspire us. That will happen, but we can also inspire ourselves by our own understanding. This is how we should be acting. <laughs> Not oh should, this is the way we want to act. So the, Rupa Goswami gives the formula. He said there's six things that are favorable for devotional service. Utsaha nishcaya darya tata karma pravartanam. Sadhu, sadhu vritti is the last one and asa sangha. And these six principles, first is enthusiasm. So what is enthusiasm? Enthusiasm means to use your intelligence to serve. That's what enthusiasm is. It's not like some external display of energy. That's necessarily enthusiasm. It may manifest like that. But use your intelligence on how best to serve. That's the definition of enthusiasm. The second one, nishtaya darya. Darya means Determination, no, I'm sorry, nishtaya, utsaham nishtaya, nishtaya, nishtaya means uh, determination. There's going to be obstacles, there are going to be reverses, there are going to be difficulties that we face. Therefore, you have to apply your intelligence in a determined way to continue with the service or to move forward and bringing about, you know, an activity that is offering that is offerable to the Lord. So determination is the feature of the will. If you say I'm going to do something, and you and you say I'm going to do it no matter what, people do that, you know, in the material world also. I'm going to get this job, whatever I have to do to get that job, I'm going to get it. And because they have such a strong will, they achieve it. When, when your will is strong, then you can become very accomplished in anything you try to achieve. But when, you don't, when, you're, when your desire is weak, and the will is also of the same nature, then things just pass you by. Although you try, you're not really doing much. So there's this thing called affirmation. It's a word. It's a, affirmation means I affirm that I will do this. It's almost like the principle of faith, how faith works to motivate people in a certain direction. But affirmation is a direct statement or a desire to, to actually perform a particular activity. I will chant my rounds nicely today. Not will I only chant, but I'm going to chant really nice. So then you think, okay, when you have that desire, Krishna gives you the intelligence to think, this is what you need to chant nicely. And the intelligence comes by the determination. 
So it's not a mechanical process. It's a process of bringing in Krishna's mercy. Although it looks like a set of rules and regulations, these are just move, things to move us in the right direction. It's the mercy of Krishna that makes everything successful or achievable. <clears throat> so in that determination, one was not wavered. Srila really, Prabhupada said that, he said, I based my success in the execution of my mission to spread Krishna consciousness on one verse from the Bhagavad Gita, which was later given, not later, but earlier given a, a commentary by Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. Vavyasatmika budhir ekeha kuranandanam buhusakya yanatas chabudeo vavasahinam. Those who are resolute in purpose and their aim is one, O oh, beloved child of the Kurus, those who is intelligence are irresolute, it's many branched. So in other words, if your mind is scattered in so many directions, you'll hardly achieve anything. You might get something. But if you're focused on you're focused on I will become Krishna conscious, then all the energies, the intelligence, and whatever else you need will be supplied to you. As Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, if you want me, I can tell I help you achieve me. If you want something else and me, then you won't get me. <laughs> You'll get something, but not really Krishna. You'll get a shadow of that relationship. So this determination inspires us. Now, in the determinate effort, there has a, the next principle is nishchaya, or daryat, daryat, patience. This is like if you got a disease and you go to a doctor and he gives you the medicine and you take the first installment of the medicine and you think, I still got the disease, what happened? It's gonna take some time. <laughs> The disease may not go away as soon as you begin the medicine, but if you can keep taking the medicine and follow the, the instructions of the doctor, eventually it'll work. Prabhupada uses the example of patience in another way. He says a woman gets married, and now she has a husband, and she thinks, oh, where's the child? Well, everything's in place. It's just a matter of time. That's all. Patience, <laughs> patience. So, but patience shouldn't cause us to become less enthusiastic. That's another, what you say, discrepancy. I've been patient, but then I'm losing my enthusiasm because nothing is happening or nothing apparently has happened. It is, but Krishna tests the devotee by allowing them to wait for the results, by seeing how determined they are in, in going forward. Just like sometimes people, yeah, I'm gonna do something. And then they do it for one day or two days, three days, and they stop. And they say, where's the determination? Where's the patience? The enthusiasm is gone. So, yeah, so apply those three principles, your enthusiasm, your determination to succeed, and be patient and work with that program. Sometimes it happens fast by our calculation, and sometimes it happens in the long run by our calculation. But it'll always, it will, because in Krishna consciousness, there's one thing you can say for sure. You can't fail. The only way you can fail is to give up. <laughs> you can't fail. This is a win-win game. As long as you stay with it. <laughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you so much for giving this wonderful class. There's this question that has been, uh, you know, speaking of you mentioned the only son part. Uh, there is this question that has been uh, coming to my mind again and again. And uh, 
uh, Srila Prabhupada, uh, you know, had health problems and, and he was asked why he has these health problems. And he says, this is because I am accepting so many disciples and spiritual master takes over the sin of the sinful reactions of the disciple. Right. And uh, this uh, human body, uh, even if, you know, we are, we are strong in our faith, we, our, this body is a network of illusion and this uh, tendency to commit sin, you know, through word, mind and deed is always there. And uh, it's uh, really difficult to transcend that. But uh, and is it a right thing to, right way to think that the spiritual master is going to take the transfer of our sinfulness? Yes, but don't sin again. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah, that's his mercy. Mm -hmm. That's the mercy of the spiritual master. He agrees to take the reactions of your karma, good and bad. First initiation, he takes part of it. The second initiation, he takes the rest. But what Prabhupada keeps saying, he doesn't have any problem with that. What he says is when people break the principles and start again going back to their old ways, this is what causes the difficulty on the spiritual master, more so. And Prabhupada writes, it's in the ninth canto and in the eighth canto, sometimes the spiritual master will have bad dreams due to the sinful reactions of his disciples, sinful activities of his disciples. So he would say, you're free now, but don't go back to, go, you know, keep those four regulative principles intact. They're foundational. No illicit sex, no intoxication, no meat eating, and no gambling. And then understand what that means in a practical way. And chant every day 16 rounds on beads without fail. He said, if you do that, then you're situated nicely and you'll make nice progress. But Prabhupada was referring a lot to when people do take initiation and they slip in their vows. When they do, then that causes difficulty for the spiritual master. Because there's a contract there. The contract is that the devotee agrees to follow the instructions of the spiritual master and that the spiritual master agrees to do everything he can to take the devotee back to the spiritual world. So if the, the disciple breaks the contract, then there, because the spiritual master is there, he's gonna get some reaction for that. And it comes out bad dreams or some physical difficulties like that. And of course, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did say, and you can read it in the fourth canto of Bhagavatam, he said, one should not take on too many disciples. But it's not clear what too many means. <laughs> so in other words, what you can manage nicely. So that's why we, in our society, we're always encouraging people to come up to the standard and accept that role of being Prabhupada's representative spiritual master. So we can spread the, uh, you know, the responsibility of con to conditioned souls. Some of, our, some of our spiritual masters have too many disciples, but the need is there. People are coming forward. What do you do? Can't refuse them. Sometimes they do, they do refuse, but, but Prabhupada had to stop at one point because his health was too much. It was too much for him to accept more and more disciples. So, yeah. But, it's not like you know, Krishna is also there and Krishna is not allowing the spiritual master to suffer completely. I mean, if, if we had to take on the full brunt of the responsibility of the sinful activities of our disciples, we, we, would, we wouldn't even be able to stay in this body. Krishna just gives you a token of that, that reaction. That's all. I remember there was one, one uh, doctor 
in India who was an abortionist. He had committed, he had uh, performed 35,000 abortions, 35,000. And now he wanted to become a devotee. <laughs> heavy karma, <laughs> really heavy karma. But I'm just saying, I'm not, I can't give any futuristic statements about what happened, but this was the situation. So sinful activities are, you know, are burdensome. And burdensome. Then you see, you know, sometimes a spiritual master gets sick. I mean, I know one spiritual master, he used to go to the doctors, and the doctors would say, you're, you're, the problems you're having with your body is not caused by your body. <laughs> In other words, it's coming from outside. He could, even the doctor could see that. So, yeah, sometimes it's like that. But the spiritual master doesn't run away from that, thinking, oh, this is too much. No, that's called the, the uh, burden of love, to take on this responsibility. But the most important thing is to become serious in your Krishna consciousness, not to make it difficult for the spiritual master. Yes, Maharaj. So, just just one follow up. Uh, in the song, you know, e baro karuna karo, there is there is one line that to, that in the presence of the spiritual master, all the sins goes away. You know, all the all the sins go away. Mm -hmm. That just by your mere presence, the sins are nowhere. Yeah, where, wherever you are, spiritual master. So not even not even those a actions, even. The moment of temp temptation that might be lust, anger, resentment, guilt, shame, all of these are also taken by spiritual master even before any action is committed. Well, there is parabdha karma also. Karma manifests in four forms of itself. One is parabdha that there is some karma that is still coming to this to the disciples that he has to work on. In other words, it's not a form of suffering, it's still a desire. In other words, although we might join Krishna consciousness and perform, we still may have lusty attractions to the opposite sex. So we have to work on that to overcome that and purify that. Or we may still have a desire to get a position in the society in order to get big money and get some, you know, accolades or some perks. Well, that's another anartha. So these things are what we call our parabdha karma. The, par the karma that is manifesting now as you perform your devotional service, not in the, in the full intensity of that karma, but in the desire that it shows. In other words, we still have that desire because it, the desire has not been purified yet. So that you have to work on. Uh, the example in the Shastras is the killing of Palambasura and the killing of Dhenakasura. Balaram kills these two demons, not Krishna. And the Balaram is the representative of the, of the pure spiritual master. The spiritual master can help to destroy these two anarthas. Uh, Palambasura represents lusty desires for the opposite sex. And uh, Dhenakasura represents uh, working hard for material gain. And he's an ass, a demon, I mean, uh, a donkey. So donkey simply works an ass, he works hard for nothing. <laughs> These two things are destroyed by the mercy of the spiritual master, and not through the process of initiation. Does that help a little? Uh, that helps. I, I never saw that as a parap karma. I mean, hmm? You never saw? I never saw those, uh, you know, inclinations as parap karma, the, the old 
activities committed are manifesting themselves in the form of those desires or those yeah, inclinations. Yeah, it's just a little bit of residue karma that is still there. It comes. Because the desire is still there. That's all. When you take initiation, Prabhupada said initiation means beginning. You're beginning to you get it, you're now you're getting on the path of bhakti. Before you're initiated, you're practicing to begin. <laughs> you're still getting benefit, but only when you take that third step, because who's what is it? Adal Shraddha Sadhu Sangha Bhajana Kriya. Bhajana Kriya is the third step. And that is taking shelter of the bona fide spiritual master, and there's five parts to that. Shelter, initiation, instructions, and inquisitiveness to continue and to move forward like that. So, yeah. So we're practicing until we get to the point of initiation. But we're still getting the benefit of the practice. It's not like we're not getting anything. But it consummates itself to the next stage, which is an art nivritti. An art nivritti is the fourth stage. Art means getting rid of unwanted desires. And there are 16 an artist, four categories of an artist. That's a whole seminar. <laughs> we just did that seminar just a month ago in New Vrindavan. And to know what is holding you back and to get the mercy of the spiritual master's instructions and guidance and to practice Krishna consciousness, that will help you to overcome it. And you, once you get past the anartha nivritti, at least 75%, then you're on nishta. Nishta means you're fixed. You're not leaving. Although you're not purified completely, you're still fixed in the process of devotional service. That's nishta. Then the next stage is ruchi. Ruchi means sweet taste. Constantly feeling happy in Krishna consciousness. Prasannatma na soshati na kangsuti samasarveshu bhuteshu madbhakti lavate pranam. That's the verse that illustrates that. No hankering, no lamenting. Prasannatma, it becomes joyful. That's the sixth stage. The seventh stage is ashakti. There's where spontaneous devotional service begins, Raghaduga Bhakti. And that's a whole series of explanations. That's all. The whole science of Bhakti is covered in these nine stages. So read the books here and you'll understand more and they can understand where you need to go and how to get there. Yes, Leela. <laughs> but the most important thing, and I just to emphasize this thing I said, is chanting of the holy name. That is the, the atom bomb, nuclear bomb, that destroys all of the anarthas that are in our way. The Hare Krishna Mahamantra. Especially Kirtan, but Chapa also. Those two things are the power of our Krishna conscious advancement. Yes. Maharaj, this is a big question. Uh, Come a little closer. Somehow I can't. It speaks so softly and the microphone echoes so much. Um, this is a big question. Um, last year, like there were um, at least a couple of instances where there was some discussion about lowering the DT standards. Discussions on? Lowering the DT standards. Lowering the DT standards, okay. Yeah. And um, th this is something like, um, like I really like have been thinking about. Um, I mean, what would be the criteria like for doing something like that, because I've heard devotees say that the entire well-being of the community depends on how nicely we take care of the deities. 
so the standard should never be lowered and um, some people said why are we even having this discussion like just lower the standards like as if it was very casual and well, yeah yeah okay continue continue and i mean i tried to like seek out the opinion of a few people like whom i trusted well, uh, why, there's two reasons why you lower the standards one not enough manpower two not enough finances these are the two things so which one is it <laughs> both both from time to time mm -hmm. yeah the Prabhupada dealt with lack of finances in, in Vrindavan. He simply re, he reduced the flowers that were being offered to the deities. He said, don't give me a garland. And he named devotees spent less money on getting flowers, mm -hmm. a lot less. So that was an incident where Prabhupada was directly consulted and he gave some guidelines. And he allowed that to happen, but it wasn't something that was an overnight choice. So, yeah, it's possible, but that is the last resort when there's nothing left. The congregation has a point by saying we should never lower it. But if they say that, then come forward and help. You tell them, all right. You're saying don't we need more power, vampire? You're telling us, you know, we don't want to lower the standards, and you don't want to lower the standards. Then help us. Come, come in, do deity worship once a week. One family comes in one night. One family comes in another night, and families can come in in the morning. Then they can't complain that if there's talking about lowering the standards. If that's their deity, let them come and help. That's where you should be your preaching. Yeah, come on. Krishna's here, not just for us. This we're we're the caretakers. He's here for he's uh that's why when Prabhupada named the deities in London, he called them Radha London Ishwara. <laughs> the controller of London. Of course he controls everything, but he wanted to make a point that these deities are for everyone in London, not just for the devotees who are in the temple. So encourage the congregation to come forward. Find ways to inspire them to um, move forward. If they if they actually care, they will do something. And they can't say they can't say they have no time. We must make time. That's all. But generally, we don't want to lower the standard. Mm -hmm. And I think when it comes to a decision that there is no other alternative, it cannot be made simply by the devotees in the temple. It has to go to the National Council. It has to go to the, to the GBC. It has to go all the way up to the top before that decision is actually consummated and should not be done simply on the local level. I saw that in the, uh, when I was in Spain, I was preaching in Spain in the early part of the century. And all of the local senior devotees got together and they wanted to, they wanted to lower the standard. So everybody agreed, temple presidents to and even the temple presidents from the neighboring temples, everybody agreed. But then it went to the National Council of Spain and they said no. They refused to allow it to happen. And it's a good thing they did because uh, they somehow or other gave directions and also facilities by which the standard could go, be maintained. And because of that, it's maintained to this day. It was never, was never de decreased. So, yeah. So sometimes when it gets to that point, assistance is needed from other areas to help 
offset that. If we try to figure it out within our the temple community, we might not be able to come up with the solution. But there's no reason why a standard should be low. If you got you got such a big congregation here, huge. So many devotees are initiated. It's a management question, and I'm not supposed to manage. <laughs> but I'm just giving my opinion, that's all. I'm not giving you any final decisions. I'm saying, this is how you go about it. Try to inspire more energy to come in and bring, make, keep the standard up, and not only keep it up, but increase the standard also. That's all I'm saying is, the energy's there, the resources are there, nothing is lacking. It's just a matter of, of bringing it about. Uh, different question. Thank you. <laughs> um, I've heard so many nice things about the London Temple. Bhaktivedanta Manor? Yeah, yeah, because they are also celebrating the 50th anniversary of Radha London Ishwara. And they're like. This is, uh, was it Radha London Ishwara or is it Radha Gokul in London? R Radha London Ishwara. Okay, yeah, all right. So that's that's the Soho Street Temple, yeah. Yeah. Bhaktivedanta Manor is Radha Gukulananda. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, what is it that is so unique? About because that? we you had know, 50 years in Chicago, we and then there is 50 years in London. They are flourishing and, like, what, their, what is their the Their location is really amazing. Of course, you have a good location here. Their location is right on the action strip where everything is happening in London. So they do Harinam every day, every day, not just once a week. They have a Maha Harinam at night, every Saturday night, where they get as many devotees come from both temples. Three temples come together on Maha Harinam. When you go into that per temple, you look at Srila Prabhupada, he's really smiling. <laughs> you can see he's very pleased. It's a preaching temple. It's a preaching temple. Mm -hmm. Books, book distribution goes on, Harinam goes on, programs going on. The devotees don't live in a very spacious area. It's a six-story building, and they live up on the fifth floor, sixth floor, I think. But they use all of the building for programs and for various types of activities. They tried to get a bigger facility, but in London, to buy something bigger costs millions and millions of pounds. It's really expensive. Houses in London are so expensive. The average house is more than $1 million, $1 million. Pounds. So, but they're in a good location. You just simply walk out the door and, uh, you know, there's activity all around. People are walking by. It's a very a hot spot, you might say, for activity. Here, your location is not so bad. I mean, there could be better locations. But location is a very important part in bringing about more and more people into our society. When I was preaching in Cincinnati, Ohio, many years ago, we had a little preaching center right across the street from the, from the uh, college. And we had a bar on the right side, we had a restaurant on the left side. 
<laughs> and uh, there were all kinds of activities all around. People would just come off the streets and say, hey, what's this place, you know? Oh, it's a Hare Krishna. Oh, what is that? Oh, come on. Have some, we give them some prasadam and we talk to them. People would just walk in off the street, not knowing what we were. So that was a campus. You know, right where we're situated right on campus. So location really helps. Here you're you're quite well established here. You've been here for how many years? Fifty years? More? More than fifty. Nineteen seventy nine? Well this is in seventy nine. So it's not quite fifty years. No. Hmm? 44, this is, what is this festival? The other temple. And the one in, what was it, Rogers, not Rogers Park, but uh, the other place. Yeah. So, yeah. Prabhupada said, management follows preaching as a shadow follows a person. Preach. Then it becomes more, more natural or more easy to manage. Preaching brings in more people. And when you have more people, then you can do more activities. This, this temple is really beautiful. It's really one of the best temples in, in America. Nothing can match that Sringasan and Prabhupada's Vyasasan. You don't see, you go anywhere in the ISKCON, you don't find a Vyasasan like that. That's really royalty, stately. This is the credit of Chicago. This Sringasan and this Vyasasan came in the 1980s by, what's his name? Gopal Patel, his name was? I think his name was. Hmm? I can't hear you. Chuck Patel, okay, Chuck Patel. He became very generous, and uh, he, I think he spent over twenty thousand dollars at the time, which is now worth more than a hundred thousand. That was back in the eighties. So yeah, this temple has—I mean, this this temple room is beautiful, it's spacious. It's got a beautiful chandelier. The altar is very attractive. Paintings, everything about the temple room is nice, except one thing, the acoustics. <laughs> if you, of course, to, get, to fix the acoustics, that would cost a lot of money. <laughs> but yeah, because the sound goes up, that's why it's so here hard to hear when people talk. Because a big ceiling just goes up. That's the only lacking here. Otherwise, it's, this temple room is beautiful. The Bajari room is big, nice, spacious, not a lot of life, a lot of room. Kitchen is, downstairs kitchen is huge. Has all, all of the qualities of a very vibrant uh, operation. Now you have to preach <laughs> more and more. Use the Sunday feast program as a preaching opportunity, not simply some opportunity to invite people in once a week. Use it to bring new people in, to have programs that are attractive to people. Yeah. I think there's plans, so, but then again, it takes cooperation, manpower.
you'll see this place is like dry wood. <laughs> it's not wet wood. Dry wood means as soon as you put a match to it, it'll light. <laughs> this place has such a history. And the history of this temple is the history of practically of ISKCON America. <laughs> this is one of the most vibrant temples ever in our ISKCON society. At least the history is there. So many, so many great personalities, you know, were part of this part of temple for many years. And preaching was very powerful. You have the best book distributor in the history of book distribution was from this temple, Manasutta. <laughs> and people don't even know who he was. He used to distribute 300 big books every day, <laughs> 300. Every day. And it was the same time when Tripurari Swami was also here. Manusutu was here. But Tripurari Swami was the one that was noticed. Manusutu was. He didn't get much notification, but he was actually the, the highest in book distribution. Very simple, but humble, unpretentious, always wanting to be in the background, never wanted to be known. He, he, he left his body about five years ago. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada disciple. And he distributed more books per day than, than anybody has ever done. Now we have another ma magical book distributor. He's in Atlanta. His name is Mah Mahotsava. He distributed Srimad Bhagavatam sets on the street. So yeah, there are devotees out there that are doing amazing preaching. And there are people in this, in this area here who have so much knowledge, experience, um, can also, even if they can't personally take part in an active way, they can give a lot of guidance and, and advice on how to move forward in a practical way. But things are happening. All right, I think we're a little bit over time here, but that's okay. Time for the other part of nourishment. It's called prasadam. Sri Prabhupada ki, Srimad Bhagavatam ki. <laughs>